Hello. Welcome to Jewel Says. I'm Julie, Jewel's grandmother, mom. If you have anything you'd like to share, email me at jewelsays at gmail.com. My cousin and I have laughed about a phenomenon we refer to as the McCarthy curse. Although our lives are pretty nice, I'll admit, relative to a lot of people in the world, we seem to be cursed with an inordinate number of things that go wrong. Little things, you know, none of them are life-threatening so far, but annoying nonetheless. But I think it would be nice to just trust that people do their jobs correctly, that things will work correctly, and probably for the most part that's true. I would have to actually track data on everything that works versus doesn't work. But it seems to both of us that a disproportionately high number of things that we touch just don't go quite right. I know I've mentioned in the past my trip, flight, and weather challenges. Most recently, Abe's and my forced luggage checking and subsequent delay, having to buy clothes to have something other than jeans and a sweater to wear in the balls-hot Amazon— and a minuscule credit as compensation for a full week in Peru being cancelled. That's just one trip this year. I've had so many flights delayed or cancelled over the years. I was randomly chosen for a COVID test, which turned out to be positive, so I was forced to quarantine for 14 days when I flew from England, visiting Catherine, to BC to visit Joanne. I've had taxi and train troubles, a taxi driver who took me on a little detour to Watford where he got into a fender bender en route to Catherine in London, a train delay that was switched to a bus and forced me to unexpectedly walk in the snow at 3 a.m. to my hotel room, and the weather challenges, cold, brisk wind and rain in Florida in April when it's not supposed to be that way, persistent torrential rain in Jamaica when it's usually sunny, hot, and relatively dry. It might not sound like a lot, but I'm only giving you examples, number one. And I don't actually travel very often, so it is a lot, I think, at least that's my perception, relative to the amount that I travel. I'm too lazy to do a full statistical analysis and compare with the general population. But I think it does happen to me more than usual. People have even said to me, I'm not traveling with you. And then there are the non-travel-related trials and tribulations. Some examples within the past month or so. I ordered beer for my son-in-law Bobby's birthday party, seemed to successfully return it, but the credit has not appeared on my credit card. When I went to the beer store on Saturday to sort it out, they were closed due to a technical issue with their tills, and the employee told me I'd have to come back on Wednesday when a manager was there. Everything is a hassle. Our mortgage payment in April was $1,200 over the expected amount, a bit of a shock, and I had to scramble to cover the amount. It turned out that the mortgage specialist had not submitted the paperwork we had signed in February. They did end up fixing it, but again, it was a hassle. And they ended up booking it as a one-time payment. So now our new mortgage renewal date is two years from May instead of April. Not that that necessarily matters. Online ordering. I ordered a tank top online that's supposed to fit in a way that means you don't need a bra. And it was pretty expensive. I received someone else's order of a compression brief instead And when I went on the website to get a return packing slip, it said they charge around $20 to return. So, of course, I had to contact them. They sent me a return packing slip without charging me. Their customer service was actually great. But still, all of this stuff takes time. Then they sent me what I ordered and stupid me. I put it on one day, assuming it would fit, headed off to do my hot dogs volunteer shift, But by the time I got home, the thing had shifted up and around. It was too long and too big, but I had worn it all day, so I couldn't even return it now. I mean, that was my own fault. But then I ordered a smaller size, but it was still too long, too big in the middle, too small in the top, so I had to return that. But at least that was my own fault. And other silly things. Oh, Abe bought some soil for the gorgeous moss he's growing out front, which, by the way, continues to generate quite a bit of buzz on the street. I'll post an updated progress pic on Facebook, maybe Instagram. 
I always forget to post things. But when he was outside working on, I, he was outside, I think, planting seeds or something one day, a teenage boy stopped and said, is that moss? Abe confirmed that it was. And then the guy said something like, I like looking at it on my way home from school. <laughs> Adorable. But Abe's plan was to augment with some fresh dirt and moss seeds. But the bags of dirt he bought had grub eggs in it. Grub eggs. Grubs are a huge problem around here. They hatch and they eat the roots of whatever you've got planted. The Weed Man is a lawn care company locally that makes quite a bit of money treating lawns for grubs, and they are difficult to get rid of, especially because we can't use toxic chemicals. But here were two brand new bags of soil rife with grub eggs. How do you know they're grub eggs, I asked him. He had Googled them. He was crushing them up so they wouldn't hatch, but this was taking a long time, and finally we just decided to return the dirt. He told the manager of the store that he should really contact the supplier and return the entire lot because other people might not notice that they're planting grubs in their lawns or their gardens. But who knows if the manager even bothered. He probably didn't care. We ended up buying a different brand, which turned out to be fine. And May 6th, I spent one night with my dear friend Terry in Kitchener to see Choir, Choir, Choir. I've told you about them. It was a great night. It was a queen sing-along. Terry said it was one of the best nights of her life, and that's saying something. But she happened to get to the hotel before I did. The front desk let her check in, and of course, they needed a credit card. When I arrived, the front desk couldn't find my reservation. No, nope, no, nope, nothing under McCarthy. Oh my God figures. So I got my phone out and looked up the confirmation number. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Somebody already checked in. Okay, so my name just disappeared. Anyway, I gave her my credit card and she assured me that the room charge would go on my card. Fine. I trusted it. The next day when we checked out, I confirmed again that the room charge would in fact be on my card. Yes, yes, Miss McCarthy, it will be. Absolutely. I then asked her to email me my receipt for the room charges. I don't want paper. No problem. Later that day, well, maybe it was the next day, I got a message from Terry. They had charged her card for the room and told her it would take four or five business days to reverse it when she called them. Plus, no receipt in my email. So now there's a hassle for Terry. So then I contacted them, and it turned out that the initial charge was apparently normal, which is what they do when you check in. And they reverse it right away. But I don't see how that should have taken four or five days and a phone call. That should have been explained to her right off the bat. So the woman at the front desk charged my card and emailed me the receipt. It's, again, not a big deal, but all these picky little things take time. Meanwhile, as I arrived in Kitchener without my computer, because it was just one night, I got an email from our accountant saying I needed to urgently sign my tax return and pay $2,000 owing as soon as possible and to let them know if there's a late penalty or interest, because I guess it, it didn't get filed until after I signed, like, May 6th. $2,000. How could I owe $2,000? And I don't have two grand just sitting around available. And the government doesn't take credit cards. But I didn't have my computer with me or time to look at the detail. So I just signed it, went online after I got home, moved some money around, and paid it. And the whole thing just kind of made me feel a bit sick. So I emailed the accountant asking for the copy of the full detailed tax return, which they only send if you ask for it. And... When I took a closer look, I could see that none of my donation deductions or my Canadian journalism deductions were on my return. And of course, this ended up in a back and forth because by now, I'm thinking they've made a mistake and I'm annoyed. It turned out that they had put my donations on Abe's return because he makes more money than I do right now. Something I had no idea you could even do. But if you're going to do that, I need to know. Because if Abe gets the tax deductions instead of me, then it makes sense that he would have to pay my tax owing that I wouldn't have owed if I'd gotten the deduction, right? 
Otherwise, I would never ask him to pay my tax bill. (sighs) I've never been financially dependent on anyone in my life other than when I was a child. And I'm not comfortable with asking anyone for anything. Anyway, they changed it. So now I'm waiting for the slow, slow, slow Canadian feds to refund what I paid them. Then this weekend, we went to Abe's brother Isaac's house to celebrate his birthday. And as Abe was making margaritas, the internal fuse of my beloved margarita blew. Damn, I love that margarita. We'll see if Abe can fix it or if I need to get a new one. So yeah, sometimes I feel as though every little thing is a hassle. At least when you're living under the cloud of the McCarthy curse. If you have a spouse who handles all your admin and your procurement, I hope you appreciate that person because all this detail and checking and fixing takes so much time when the little things go wrong. This is also why I won't automate bill payments. I've had times in the past when it took months to get automated payments stopped when you stop a service. No thank you. I do not trust your systems. I do not trust that things operate correctly. And it often makes me wonder if incompetence is the norm. Of course, I make mistakes at work too, but not all the time. And I probably over-communicate because I think it's so important for expectations to align with reality. I don't want to surprise people. And in the case of my taxes, it turned out not to be an error. It was just a matter of me not knowing what they had done and why. Speaking of incompetence, I would love to understand what's with dermatologists. As far as I can tell, and if you're a dermatologist, please correct me if I'm wrong, But as far as I can tell, they can do two things. Diagnose skin cancer or prescribe cortisone. That seems to be it. Oh, I guess Carrie told me they can prescribe Accutane too. In 2018, I got what appeared to be a bite on my left hand at the office in Sarnia, and it never went away. It morphed into this thing that just seemed to build up skin cells. I tried vitamin C serum, vitamin E cream, calamine lotion, antibiotic ointment, wart freezer, wart dissolver, retinol, and then I finally started just cutting it and filing it down with an emery board. It just kept coming back. I finally booked myself at a skin clinic and asked them to burn it or laser it off because I'd rather have a scar than this thing. But they wouldn't do it because they didn't know what it was. I also started getting these itchy little spots here and there that were similar but never as bad as this one. They didn't keep building up. And they look like bites, but I can't find anything in the house that would have been biting me, and Abe wasn't getting them. And at at one point, I had a family doctor who referred me to a dermatologist. Oh, here we go, I thought. He looked at pictures I emailed in. No idea. Eventually, I got an in-person appointment. He looked at it in person. Still no idea. So what did he do? He prescribed cortisone cream. Well, at least I knew it wasn't cancer, since dermatologists can only do two things. Oh, yeah, and prescribe Accutane. I knew it wasn't acne. And of course, the cortisone didn't work. I just have to keep putting corn removal pads on it to keep it at bay. At least it'll flatten out if I'm going somewhere special and wearing my pretty ring. I can put a little makeup on it, but it's ridiculous. Nobody knows what it is. So recently, Carrie had an appointment with a dermatologist. Why? I asked her. It's clearly not cancer, so you're getting a useless prescription for cortisone cream. Treat the symptom. He'll have no idea what it is. Well, guess what Carrie got? Cortisone cream. And I'll be very surprised if it helps. Who knows what the root cause of it is? They never know. Oh, well. I can't believe that after getting a medical degree and then going for years to get a specialty and then what it takes to become a dermatologist, that that's all there is to it. There must be more. There must be something you guys can cure. So I'm just curious. I'd really like to know. I was chatting recently with one of my nieces about her work. How's it going? Are you getting enough hours? It's boring, she said. "Uh Uh-huh. But are you getting enough hours? 
Your rent is expensive, so I worry about you. I'm trying to get a serving job, she told me. Where have you applied? Oh, lots of places I just apply on Indeed.com, she says. That's where all the jobs are. Well, I suggested, again, at the risk of sounding like a nagging old bat, have you tried going into any restaurants to apply in person? No, she insisted. Things are different now. All the jobs are on Indeed. That may indeed be true. But that only works if you have a strong resume. You've never had a serving job. You need to know someone or you need to meet someone who likes you and wants to give you a shot. I could tell she didn't believe me. She thinks I'm old school and don't know any better. But I went on anyway. Even in the IT world, where you would think applying online would make the most sense, we're not usually dealing with the public every day. People hire people they know and like. I wish you would at least try making an in-person connection. When I was working in Sarnia and trying to find a job in Toronto, no one gave me an interview. My resume was just another text document in a stack of hundreds, if not thousands. I got no traction until I attended a user conference and met people in person. Please, just try it. And it's true, I may be old. Well, I am old. But if I were running a restaurant, I wouldn't even consider hiring someone without experience unless I met them. And yeah, you can argue that's what the interview is for, but how do you stand out enough to get the actual interview? This person needs to represent your business well. Who you are matters, your vibe, your energy, your you And I don't think I'm wrong on this, and I hope she figures it out soon, because even with roommates, it's so hard to make ends meet in the city. And I just, I just want her to succeed. Of course, obviously, there was no internet when I was a young job seeker, so we had to do the in-person thing. And I got my first official job working for Dr. Ellis, my dentist, when I was 15 years old. And it was an amazing job for a 15-year-old. But I know for a fact the only reason I got that job was because he knew me, he knew my family, and my mother had worked for him. That's how she paid for our orthodontic work, such that it was. I had four permanent teeth pulled to make room and a retainer to widen my upper palate. Not the best methods by today's standards, but it was the early 70s and my mother had always been self-conscious of her own smile, so she made sure we had orthodontic intervention. I loved Dr. Ellis, as in, I loved Dr. Ellis. I'm not sure whether I loved him as much as my grade 10 Spanish teacher, Mr. Euler, but but maybe Dr. Ellis is partly why I love going to the dentist to this day. Those two men were my schoolgirl crushes at that age, and I can tell you those crushes can be intense. I sat at the front of my Spanish class because I was really short. Plus, my distance vision wasn't great, and I couldn't read the board from the back of the room. And Mr. Euler would sometimes sit partly on my desk, kind of perched, where I could breathe in his aura. He was slender and tall, with a neatly trimmed beard, not good-looking by any of my friends' standards. But I thought he was such a refined, intelligent, worldly gentleman. He spoke several languages in his gentle, steady tone. I imagined that he was always calm and kind, never drunk, never loud, never critical. I would sometimes peek up at Dr. Ellis, breathing in his aura as I laid back in the reclining dental chair, his face so close to mine. He was younger and cooler than Mr. Euler, and a lot less mysterious because he was also a friend of my parents. He and his new wife, who was gorgeous, lived in one of the first condominiums we had ever heard of, the new cool thing, and they had a great Dane. They did all kinds of outdoor activities, they traveled, they ran. He seemed to be always calm, always kind, never drunk, never loud, never critical. Neither of these grown men had any idea that 15-year-old Jules had a crush on them. But had they been the type of men who would take advantage of that, I would have been completely vulnerable and easily manipulated. Which is why grown men need to stick to grown women. 
At that age, it's so common for young girls to intensely romanticize the object of our affection. That can be dangerous. Needless to say, I was pretty excited when my mother, Doroth, asked me if I would like to work for Dr. Ellis. Would I? Ah, uh, yes, I would. I wanted to work. I wanted to make money. And I used to read the Help Wanted female section in the paper. Yes, it was all separated by gender back then. Looking for something I could do. This was my golden opportunity. My ticket to riches. I would be paid $2 an hour, and I would be rich. The job was every day after school. Dr. Ellis worked long days, and his full-time staff finished at 4 p.m., so I would take over for the evening. I answered the phone, booked appointments, greeted patients, and showed them to their chairs, developed x-rays, sterilized and set up the instruments, poured the stuff into the impressions to make those little clay teeth models, and I assisted Dr. Ellis when he did procedures. And at the end of the night, I cleaned all the rooms and vacuumed. I bought an adorable little white nurse uniform. I felt so grown up, like a real professional. Working for him cured my crush, not because he was a bad boss, but I think it was just the added layer of familiarity. Now, you might be thinking it wasn't fair that I was basically handed that job without anyone else having a chance to apply. But the reality is, if you know someone, and you know they're trustworthy, you know they're eager to work, you know they care about doing a good job, of course you're not going to take a chance on an unknown entity. These things matter. I don't care what the job is. You can't necessarily tell if someone has those qualities from a resume, and you can't necessarily tell from a 30-minute interview, and you certainly can't tell from online. Plus, employers aren't even allowed to give honest references anymore, at least not in Canada. All they're allowed to say is, yes, this person worked here in this position. And sometimes you meet someone and you just get a good vibe. It's all part of trusting your gut. If you get a bad vibe, trust it. If you get a good vibe, you can probably trust that too. Sadly, though, I had to leave that job when my family moved to Sarnia a month after my 16th birthday. Dr. Ellis, no doubt, hired someone else he knew who would not let him down. I was unemployed until the following year when I was hired, with no connection, to be a lifeguard and swimming teacher, which was also a pretty sweet job. I can honestly say that the lifeguard job was the only job I ever got without having any connection first. When I was actively looking for work in Toronto in 2007-2008, I, I was following the current wisdom of applying online. I tailored my resume and cover letter for the jobs I applied for. I applied for jobs that I could have done almost blindfolded. I did have a pretty strong resume in terms of skills and experience, so I couldn't understand why I wasn't getting a bite. Zero interviews. It really felt demoralizing, so I get it. I get it. Then a friend of mine who was an HR executive told me that somewhere in the range of 80% of all jobs are not even posted. And a lot of the companies post jobs even though they already know who they plan to hire because they have to post them. It's policy. So a lot of the jobs are posted as a formality, and they're not really even looking at anyone else. And even at the age of 47, even with the years of experience I had, a track record of results, even with all that, I had to figure out a way to get noticed. So I booked a day off work and registered for an SAP user group meeting. And that was the ticket. Within a couple of days, I had three calls for interviews, and within a week, I had a job offer. And since then, every job, every gig I've gotten has been purely through reputational word of mouth. I had one hiring manager tell me that he had interviewed several people, but decided to hire me based on the advice of a trusted colleague with whom I had worked on a previous project. Apparently, he had told him something like, maybe one of these people you interviewed will be fine, but I guarantee you with 100% certainty that your project will succeed if you hire Julie. That's worth a hell of a lot. What that also means is it's important to understand that every day at work is an audition for your next job. 
So go ahead and apply online, but please don't sell yourself short by thinking that's all you need to do. You must, must, must get out there and meet someone who gets your good vibe and invites you to the table. And once you get a seat at the table, show up reliably, solve problems, be someone people want to work with. It's not that hard. And in fact, it really feels good at the end of the day. Thank you for listening. Jules Says is produced, written, recorded, edited, and mastered by me, Julie McCarthy. Music by Julie McCarthy. Have a fabulous week. Thank you.